Welcome everyone to Friday Night's Young at Heart, featuring nursery rhymes, stories, songs, poems, Mother Goose, Aesop's Fables, Lewis Carroll, Limerick's Larks, stories of the great operas, epics, and such. To keep us all Young at heart. Tonight we're continuing with Sir Gawain and the Green Knight with this alliterative translation by Simon Armitage, published in New York, Norton, New York, New York. As you may recall, we left last week with the Green Knight appearing at the court of King Arthur and Guinevere and all the knights of the round table and guests and the green knight, mysterious, part material, part spiritual, but green, green everywhere, although red eyes. And he offers a challenge, which is typical at the end of the Christmas season before it is, it is Twelfth Night here in the court. And he challenges any of the knights to come and cut off his head with this magnificent axe that he holds in his hands. But if whoever does dare to come forward to chop off his head, in one year and a day, he will come back and chop off their head. What a game! What foolery! Everyone is terrified. And the last words of the Green Knight, as he looks around the room, as you recall, we concluded last week on this phrase, does no one have the nerve to wager in this way? Flustered at first, now totally foxed were the household and the lords, both the high-born and the low. Still stirruped the knight swiveled round in his saddle, looking left and right. His red eyes rolling beneath the bristle of his bushy green brows, his beard swishing from side to side. When the court kept its counsel, he cleared his throat and stiffened his spine. Then he spoke his mind. So, here is the house of Arthur, he scoffed, whose virtues reverberate across vast realms. Where's the fortitude and fearlessness you're so famous for? And the breathtaking bravery and the big-mouthed bragging, the towering Reputation of the round table, skittled and scuppered by a stranger. What a scandal! You flap and you flinch, and I've not raised a finger. <clears throat> then he laughed so loud that their leader saw red. Blood flowed to his fine-featured face and raged inside. His men were also hurt. Those words had pricked their pride. But born so brave at heart, the king stepped up one stride. Your request, he countered, is quite insane, and folly finds the man who flirts with the fool. No warrior worth his salt would be worried by your words. So in heaven's good name, hand over the axe, and I'll happily fulfill the favor that you ask. He strides to him swiftly and seizes his arm. The man mountain dismounts in one mighty leap. Then Arthur grips the axe, grabs it by its haft, and takes it above him, intending to attack. 
Yet the stranger before him stands up straight, highest in the house by at least a head. Quite simply he stands there stroking his beard, fiddling with his coat, his face without fear. About to be bludgeoned, but no more bothered than a guest at the table being given a goblet of wine. By Guinevere, Gwaine, now to his king, inclines and says, I stake my claim. This moment must be mine. Should you call me courteous lord, said Gawain to his king, to rise from my seat and stand at your side, politely take leave of my place at the table and quit without causing offence to my queen, then I shall come to your council before this great court, for I find it unfitting, as my fellow knights would, when a deed of such daring is dangled before us, that you take on this trial, tempted as you are, when brave, bold men are seated on these benches, men never matched in the metal of their minds. Never beaten or bettered in the field of battle. I am weakest of your warriors, and feeblest of wit, loss of my life would be grieved in the least. Were I not your nephew, my life would mean nothing. To be born of your blood is my body's only claim. Such a foolish affair is unfitting for a king. So, being first to come forward, it shall fall to me. And if my proposal is improper, let no other person stand blame. The knighthood then unites, and each knight says the same. Their king can stand aside and give Gawain the game. Now the plot moves forward. You know, we began those first few nights with lots of description, but now the plot really is moving forward. I hope it's intriguing you more and more, and as we come to know Gawain and just what kind of young, young knight this is, and what will befall him if, in fact, if you don't know, he will chop off the head of the green knight. I have a feeling we might be reading this each Friday night up through and including Halloween. A fitting ending to such a story, even though it takes place at Christmas time. A strange Christmas tale. But then we know Christmas is filled with ghost stories. You know the most popular one. Maybe. We'll see. Thank you so much for joining me. Have a wonderful weekend. I'm really enjoying tackling this for you, with you, and uh, lots of love to everybody. Have a good night. Bye.